there's certain nights when it's just great to do what we do. When it's like, let's watch that game. We'll see what happens. We'll do a podcast after. I didn't know what was going to happen tonight. The line was Minnesota by three. It moved to Minnesota by four. You could have told me they were going to win by 20 and put a defensive performance of the ages. You could have told me they weren't going to be ready yet. What I wasn't expecting is Denver playing as great of an offensive game against good defense as I've seen in a while. I mean, they shot 19 for 29 from three, 32 for 50 from two. And these were high degree of difficulty shots or so. This is Jamal Murray at the top of the third quarter, just making four straight long jumpers on good defense with a hand in his face. And Jokic maneuvering down the stretch. Gordon's 11 for 12. They were just awesome. So I'll start here. Feels a little Mahomes Chiefs December 2023-ish, right? They're down 0-2. We're like, ah, it's over, including me. It's done. You Pour thought it was over. I thought did. I over. thought I thought Minnesota was going to sweep them, mainly because I didn't think Murray had what he did the last two games in him. He looked like he was physically compromised to me. And then all the other stuff, it was like, hey, man, they had a great run. Hard to go back to back. It's Minnesota's time. And in a weekend, it shifts. I picked Minnesota. I felt like it was a coin toss. And after game two, it was defensive display, which was like, I think it's the best 24 minutes I've seen from a team defensively in a long time. As we, far we both as like, led our pods with right, it. Right. After, you know, you're at Denver defending champs, those first 24 minutes, I, I just think were horrifying for Denver. But I think once it turned into the sweep talk, like I don't ever think there's going to be sweeps when the teams are bad because it's human nature to let down a little bit. And then in this case, you have Denver where you think, okay, look, it's hard to win a title. We can talk about an easier path for them with the Heat in the finals and the Lakers in the Western Conference finals. Like, yeah, traditionally, if you look back at it, like it's not the toughest course, but they'd gone through the years of disappointment. They'd gotten their playoff scars. And I just, the one like tenant of the playoffs for me every single year is you can never be as desperate as the team that is down 0-2. You just can't be. And if they're any good, which we've learned again, that Denver is really good, that they're going to come out and fight. I thought they went a lot quicker in game three because like the biggest problem that I saw yeah. in game two is when you wait, and Denver likes to be methodical. You know, they'll run their offense, they'll wait, they'll kind of see what's going on. It's like, look, if you wait, they are on you. And I thought they were more aggressive. And then tonight's just an absurd display, as you pointed it out. It's 76-60. Denver shooting splits <laughs> were 67 and 53%. It's nuts. Well, you think like game three, it was tight for the first quarter, right? And they ch they called that game differently and they, and they didn't let a lot of the physical stuff go. Minnesota missed some layups. They missed some easy shots. Denver all of a sudden's up 12. And then they just started to separate. And it was like, oh, they, they got their mojo back. But I'll be interested to see if they call this differently and Minnesota can do what they did in game two. Can Denver handle it? What I don't understand, and I was really watching carefully tonight trying to figure it out, how did Jokic and Murray figure out the pace on offense? Something they did, say, like part of it was I think they put they put their shooters, like if you look like Gordon's basically under the basket and two guys in the corner or there were two guys, you know, on one side, but they were trying to give those guys as much space as possible. But something slowed down for them that in the first two games, it was just too frantic and too frenetic. And they figured out a way to just, just comment to the pace that they wanted to get to. And I, I didn't really fully understand how they did it. And they made some great shots. I mean, Gordon, Gordon made five shots he makes once a month. Right, and that Murray shot that he hit in McDaniel, where McDaniel was just all over him, it reminded me of game two defense. Right. I was like, uh-oh, here we go. Like, is this going to be, they're going to get a stop here and some sort of momentum, and then Murray just finds a way to finish it off to his right side. I like talking about game three and four here, if you're cool with it, just because yeah. like, I think the officiating part of it I went back and watched the first seven fouls once it got to 36-23. You're talking about game, you're talking about game three. Game, game three. I, I thought those first seven fouls that were called, the only one that was suspect was the first one where Jokic initiates the contact into Cat's chin, and he knew kind of what he was doing, and the officials are like, all right, it's on the floor, which it always makes me feel like the officials are like, we don't even love that we're calling this, but we have to call something on this play. The rest of the time, they're just hacking him, I thought. Yeah, and I agree. But tonight. they were hacking him in game two, and I think they were getting away with it. I think that was part of the problem because it was prison ball in game two, and I think they thought it was going to carry over, and it just didn't. 
It felt like game two, Denver was like, wait, are, is, are you guys seriously going to play like this? We're <laughs> right. not ready. Okay, yeah. we're not ready. And the combination of really good players getting incredibly frustrated. And that's what happens to like great competitors is they're usually yeah. going to just start losing their minds because they're going, I can't believe we feel this helpless. Yeah, and Minnesota then, was doing the Hagler Hearns pace in game two. And Denver was <laughs> yeah. like, wait, what? <laughs> so then when I looked at at game three, so you're right. Like I'm, I'm going, I'm sampling in some game two stuff here as well. But when I think about game three, first of all, Denver didn't turn the ball over until deep into the second quarter. I thought Minnesota's offense stunk. They missed some so and many bunnies and laps. Ugh. I think there's some real truth in that this Timberwolves team is young and was really feeling themselves on a couple of days off. Hearing about you know, because I had moments in game two where I was like, "Is this the finals?" Like I feel like this series is the finals. You know, I agree with you. I said that to my family because my whole family, my my wife, my son and daughter, Mother's Day, nothing better on Mother's Day than watching an NBA playoff game. I know my wife was fired up. And at some point, my daughter said, who are you rooting for? And I was like, I think I'm rooting for Minnesota because Denver's probably slightly, but but I think both of these teams are are probably favored against the Celtics. They're just playing at a level of efficiency Minnesota defensively and Denver offensively that I'm not positive the Celtics can match over the course of two weeks without Porzingis. It's if a funny question. Porzingis, I'd be okay. It's, it is funny though, because when you think about who you root for, and a lot of it's just you and I, like with our investment in our takes, it's, <laughs> right. it's I want, want to be able to retire on this take or I don't want to be dreadfully wrong, even though it's going to happen. After game two, where it turned into like, I was like, wait, we can't, we can't, can't Jokic lose in this series first before everybody's ready to pile on about how undeserving he is of all these things. I couldn't and, believe the text I was getting from people who were smart. I'm not going to name them, but they were I like, oh, your it. guy Jokic. I'm like, what? <laughs> did you see what Minnesota did? Like, who was stopping them in that game? In a weird way, I felt like after game two and then they won game three, I was happy for Denver. <laughs> I was just happy yeah. for Jokic because I went, well, he can't possibly go out this way. And then again, tonight's an even more dominant reminder because he just wanted to shoot. I mean, he took 26 shots tonight and there's only been one game in two months going back into the regular season where he's taken more than 26 shots in a game. And well, I think he he has like a plan. Like I think Cat does a good job of holding up with him physically than a strength thing. And then with the go bear part of it floating, like Jokic may be more likely to want to play make a little bit. Like that pass that he had to Gordon, and that was actually Ant's fault. He just lost Gordon behind him as Cat and, and Rudy. Oh, the one where him. he leaned to his left? Oh that little God. sneaky oh my that sneaky right. pass around three guys. That was nuts. Right. And Jamal's on the call going to Reggie Miller's like, did you even see that pass? Like the perfect answer would have been like, yeah, after he made the basket, I saw it. But you can see with Jokic, like there's a tier of of what he'll do depending on who's in now. And I think that's what he's figured out going back into three and four. If he has just Rudy, he's going right at him every time. He can't wait. If he goes at Nas, even more so. With the Cat-Rudy thing, he's probably a little bit more reserved because he's trying to figure out how Rudy's going to come to him. Because I think Cat at least, and we'll get to Cat because it wasn't very good tonight. I think Cat at the, the very least like holds up somewhat physically knowing that there's help there. But you can see depending on what Minnesota is doing and matching him with personnel, he seems to change. And I think at this point, like the scary part for Minnesota is I think he's figured out all of their options already. I, let's stay on this because I like where you're going with it. Because it, it's not to bring Mahomes back into this, but Mahomes will have those playoff games when it's like, I need to use my legs today. I'm going to have, I'm probably going to have to run nine times. And Jokic in game three, I thought he realized, you know, everybody's got to play. We, we need collectively to be awesome. This is not a game for me to take 35 shots or whatever. Today was the game where, especially the way Edwards came out, Edwards came out like he was 2001 Kobe. And, Jokic played differently. I mean, he had, I think, 16 in the fourth quarter, but he just, yeah. he'll put the weight on himself when he knows that they need it. But they also, I mean, the, the, when you think like Gordon's 11 for 12, Murray makes a 55-footer and like five other crazy shots, and then Jokic is shooting the way he shot, and then they get the random couple holiday threes. You're not going to beat them. Like, if I'm Minnesota, I leave, if I'm the coach in the locker room after, and I probably ask, like, Carl, can you, can you stay after everybody leaves for just two minutes? Just want to talk to you. Um, just 
and just get, we'll stay between us. We'll go into the equipment room. Um, if I'm Minnesota, I I don't feel terrible about that game. So like, just look at the <laughs> look at some of the stuff we're doing. McDaniel's was picking up dudes ninety feet and putting the miles on Murray and doing all the stuff you have to do. But Murray was just different physically than he was five days ago. The guy in game one and game two was not remotely resembling the guy from game three and game four, I thought. And when he plays like that, they're at a different level. But I mean, there's other stuff here. Like nobody showed up with Ant tonight offensively. Nas, Nas, I think was five for six off the bench, but Towns was just so abhorrent in this game and just was playing the, it was another Towns greatest hits bad game. I think at one point he had 17 shots for 13 points. He did his requisite terrible foul, 55 feet from the basket. Uh, and then Gobert, here's another thing I got for you, Rosillo. Like they played their best game in game two. Gobert didn't play. Uh, here we, we go. We got to talk about it. I mean, we, we it has to be discussed. Let's do the cap part first. Yeah, let's do it. Not, I wouldn't call him one of our favorites. I can't stand him. <laughs> <laughs> he started one of 10. <laughs> he heated up, got to four of 16 at one point. He had the half court foul that is completely pointless for a guy that's trying to take the charge trouble. at mid court. How many times have they called the charge at mid court this season? Right. Like four? He did try to take the other charge there, which is fine, but he complained. And look, this is turning into a complaint first league, but you know, if you're really, really good, even if I'll be annoyed over two hours, that's okay. Cat's not good enough to complain as much as he does. And so then he had later in the second half, he had that offensive foul where he the chucked Michael play. Porter Jr. And he celebrated the make. thinking After he shoved them backwards one. into the basket support. Right. And and he's, got his hand, he's got his hand up in the air as everybody's walking to the other end of the court. <laughs> he was the last person in the entire arena to know that the foul was on him. He also had another play where it looked like Minnesota wanted to try to defend their pressure as much as they could. And the problem is, is like, you might win a possession with that, catching them off guard. But against a team like Denver, you're just opening up all this space behind it. And they've been torched on that. And he had a play where it was like, you couldn't foul there. Like, you can't foul. And he actually, like, hit Jokic in the back. I think the rest were just like, we don't even want to do it. And it's crazy to think he's the best three-point shooting player. I don't know what the number is after because I didn't look it up after the game sorted tonight. But coming in, he's the best three-point shooter in the playoffs. And I don't care. I don't care. I, you know, in theory, he's what you need for Ant, somebody who can play, who can match another big body, which I think he's actually done okay with. But when he has to think about defensive decisions, then it becomes a mess. He had plays in game three, Bill, where there'd be like a baseline drive and he'd be in the paint and he would like run to close out on Christian Brown on the opposite side of the, Christian Brown, excuse me, on the opposite side of the ball. Yeah. You're like, of, of all the places you should prioritize, that's not where it should happen. I know he's going to have a big night where he's going to hit a bunch of threes or whatever. I just don't care. I don't care. I don't trust him. And you would well, think Well, he was so good in game one and game two that it made me, that it, he turned the corner. I mean, he is hitting his mid twenties, you know, I, I, here's a good example. And this doesn't show up in the box score, but Edward starts out and there's flame shooting out of his ass. And it's just clear. He's going to have at least 40 points. Right. And then all of a sudden towns is like, now it's my turn. He did that. He did that thing for you, for when somebody who was going to have the game Edwards was going to have tonight where he was, I thought he was absolutely spectacular and I actually saw him tired in the fourth quarter, which I don't think we've seen him tired ever. He got tired in the third quarter after he went on that barrage. Yeah. And then there was a moment where he was like, he had to take a couple possessions off. Like you could see it from him. So you're it was right. Like a totally it was great. like a Drago. Oh my God, the Russian is caught. It was like, I, oh my God, Edwards gets tired. Um, but I think with Edwards, especially the way he's playing tonight, you just want supporting actors with him when he's going to have a game like that. You want like, this is heat and he's De Niro and Pacino combined. You want Towns to be Sizemore, where he's going to have like three scenes and he's then he's going to do his, for me, the action is the juice. And it's like, oh, cool. Tom Sizemore had a moment. Now get out of the way. We're going to get back to De Niro and Pacino. But Towns is just, he, I, I feel like he thinks it's the two of them together. And tonight was a night when it was not. This was a, I, the other guy that I, I just felt like wasn't involved enough was Conley. Because I like the matchups Conley has in this series, right? We've seen point guards over and over again be able to get into the paint, do slash and kick stuff, and just create offense. 
And a lot of times he's just standing over on the side because everything has to run through Edwards and Towns. Do you think Chris Finch being injured actually might have cost them a game here in this series out of the first four? I mean, no. I voted for him second in coach, coach of the year. No, because I, I, okay. he's right there. <laughs> it's different, though. Really? He's not, you're walking around, you're, wait, like, when you're actually coaching and you're able to move and move up and down the sidelines and talk to your guys versus I'm just sitting on the side, like I'm like Denzel and the bone collector. Like, I, I just don't think it's the same because I thought they lost their composure and did some weird shit tonight. It, it was a really sloppy, uh, offensive. Like I, I just thought their identity was all over the place. If Ant didn't have the game they, that he had, they would have lost by 25. Yeah, I couldn't believe, like, there's a bunch of moments where I go, okay, six minutes, they're down 11. Like, they're, are they going to grind this thing out? Are they going to find a way yeah. to grind the whole thing out? But there's just too many moments where I didn't I didn't trust anybody else around Ant, whether it's the cat stuff that we've already talked about. And, you know, Rudy ended up with some points because he got fouled a bunch of times there at the end. But he just had those moments with him where, you know, with the ball in his hands, you're like, oh, man, what's going to... His post-up against Jokic, that's going to end chair. up on... T that's going to end up on TNT at some point. Like Jokic just chess moving him to be like, oh, wait, you think you're going to like McHale me right now? I'm just going to matador off to the side. You're not even going to feel me because you're so uncomfortable already. And then Rudy like gets called for the travel. That'll be in that'll be in some like one shining moment version of, of the NBA broadcast. So wait, wait, you know, can you hold on for on that for one second? Yeah, because I think for guys like us, we've never blocked. We've never had a chase down block against the no. backboard. But we have pulled the chair. I'm retired now. But when you pull the chair in a really good way where the guy almost like falls over and hits his face, it's about as satisfying of a defensive moment as you can have. Right? What's better? I I don't like when people do it outside on the asphalt. I think it's bullshit. What about inside? <laughs> I, um, like, I didn't realize you were anti-pulling the chair. <laughs> yeah, I just think it means you can't play defense i guess i've just had too many people pull the chair when i was younger you know some older guy at lunch hoops do you like, want to do a psa play. should we do a psa for the ringer nba channel i'm ryan Russillo. i'm gonna get killed for even bringing it up you know, like, i oh, want to talk Russillo about pulling like the chair the ch yeah no he's gonna no the, the, the way to the when when you pull the chair when i when it's okay is when you're going against the tall guy who thinks he can just swing into you with his elbows out and just basically bulldoze over you and that's when it's okay. No, that's. Um, I don't. I don't think you're Listen, wrong. I think we'll most agree people, to think, disagree. Yeah, then we can disagree sometimes. I think more people will agree with you, and I understand the position. For, hey, at least it's not a charge. At least it's not a charge, because you start True. trying to like slide over outside in a pickup game, and then you just decide it's the charge. Like if you put the effort in and then get hit and then fall down, no one has ever in the history of pickup. First of all, you shouldn't do it in the first place, but. Nobody would ever be like, ah, I think I was still moving. <laughs> the guys always like charge. <laughs> be like, someone else has to see it for you to be able to get the call. Like, what are you, what are you kidding? Anyway, everybody's What's, favorite part what, of the pod. Just quickly on Denver, we we talked about uh, what a great moment this was for them. I think the three days off helped everybody, including myself, just pouring dirt on them, being like, it's fine, man. It's really hard to go back to back, especially with how deep the league is now. The amount of pride that they showed in game three, where they just came out throwing haymakers with their and got their identity back, just rebuilt it over the course of 72 hours. And then winning that game today, the crowd seemed like it was good both nights too. But winning that that game today on the road with the way Edwards was playing. I thought the crowd was better tonight. I think they were I think they were so ready to just erupt in game three. You know, this is a Minnesota franchise that hasn't felt anything well, you like know, this. This, this is the than, Steve Kerr theory. Right. Steve Kerr always said the the young the young playoff team that hasn't had a lot of great playoff moments that first game home, the crowd's almost so fired up. It was like game three Net Celtics when the Celts had the big comeback in the second half, but that first half they suck because the crowd's like, ah, let's go. Everyone's in the seats forty five minutes before the game. And then somebody makes two threes on the other team and you're like, What? Oh no. What's going on? And it's just like it doesn't go by the plans. But um I just love when champs defend the title, which we've talked about. I don't know how we've been doing this probably for seven years on Sundays. My favorite, I, I think it's one thing to win the championship. I think it's another thing to defend it 
It's something I wrote about in my book. I really feel like the title defense should count when you talk about the great teams. And I love that they fought back because I didn't think they were going to. I really thought this was going to be a passing of the torch. They had no chance in Minnesota type of series. As blown as I, as blown away as I was in game two, I, I guess then once I started seeing everything that was happening on the TV shows and everything, the question I'd ask like any of us is, haven't you watched series before though? <laughs> like haven't, we've been doing this 40 years. I know, but this was unusual. Do you see this stat? This only five times somebody has lost the first two at home and then won the series. Five times ever. I'm not even talking about game four because I didn't know what was going to happen in game four. Yeah. But for Denver, for Denver, who we, we both think is really good, you know, before we saw the Minnesota Phoenix series, before we saw the Denver and LA series, I think both of us were like leaning towards, I know we both weren't going to pick Boston against Denver unless you no, saw I some version Denver. of Boston. Yeah. I yeah, running. Right. So I just think there's so many moments in a series where the teams look completely different 48 yeah. hours later. and. I guess I I feel like sometimes I'll be just listening to stuff going, wait, this is your first year doing this? Not you necessarily, but this, Denver's too good to have had everybody being like, this is a wrap. And there was just so many people talking sweep. I was surprised. I think the Murray thing was a big piece of that though. Cause that's just, your out then. That's your no, out. No, it's not even an yeah. out. I, he just looked like he was legitimately hurt and it wasn't going to get better. You know, and I don't know if they if they did the Mexico, my Miami, Germany trip between game two and game three, but he looked way better and was moving way better and looked like Jamal Murray again. And that was a guy I did not expect to uh, to see in the in the playoffs. He was 11 for 21 in game three. Today was eight for 17. Um, Ant finished with 44 and was 16 for 25. But we didn't mention this yet. Sometimes this happens in a basketball game where you just know the other team's going to lose. And that eight-point barrage at the end of the second quarter Ugh. was just so stupid. It's like I, nobody's seconds. nobody's ever won when this some, when they did something this stupid at the end of a half. And that turned out to be the eight-point. And that eight-point cushion they had the whole second half, basically with these 20 seconds that they just fucked up. They give up the Pope three. Then you get the turnover. Okay, fine. But in a game then that McDaniels matters doesn't this run much, back. Right. Gordon just but goes down. But to inbound it that way, knowing there's like as, as rare as the chance is, but to even open yourself up. And I think that's one thing that you've always talked about with the playoffs that we see it play out all the time with just certain people aren't comfortable as the series goes on. And I don't even know if that's what happened there. It's like, oh, this young team, they just weren't smart enough. They weren't comfortable. Although I thought there's just a lot of dumb stuff that's been happening with them yeah. um, on top of everything else. But I that, that eight-point swing... Because you're like, hey, this has been a grind. Denver can't miss. Jokic has been incredible. And all of a sudden it goes from what? It would have been, it ended up being a 50. So it's going to be a seven point halftime lead to a 15 point half. They get a half stop at seven points. It goes to 15 instead. Um, I have to talk about this, even though it's the most sports radio topic possible. I couldn't believe they didn't suspend Murray for game three because. Any other time we've had that kind of situation in the NBA playoffs, they've always defaulted to, look, we can't say there's special circumstances here because it's a huge game for the other team or whatever. It's just the rule's the rule. The rule got broken and it's a suspension. And yet in this case, they didn't suspend him. And they fined him $100,000, but didn't suspend him. And what he did was clearly a one game suspension. I guess there's less precedent because I was thinking about like the 07 Phoenix is the all time worst for me. Right. When Horry throws Nash against the scores table and the guys on his bench who see their leader get thrown against the scores table take like five feet of steps toward it for stopping. And they're like, oh, you guys got to sit out now. Um, the 97 Knicks Heat, which I'd kind of, it's so long ago I forgot, but they, Stern staggered the suspensions, <laughs> spending their best five guys over two days because they left the bench. And then Draymond was the other one where they could have rescinded the 16th, whatever, technical, and they decided not to. And then Cleveland comes back in 2016. But over and over again, they've told us like, hey, we don't play favorites with this shit. The rules are the rules. And in this case, they, I felt like they totally played favorites with this. They're like, ah, we can't suspend Murray. Then they're not, then they have no chance in the series. I thought it was crazy, Rosillo. You're probably right. I didn't care. 
It didn't bother me. Well, I would rather they handled it this way, but now I want to go back retroactively and be like, could we have done that with some of the other ones now? Could we get Stoudemire yeah. and Dia to play in game five now? Can we get Draymond to actually play in game five and try to finish off the title? It just feels like it had no correlation to the rest of NBA history. Do you remember when David Stern went on with Dan Patrick for that Suns thing? Yeah, I don't know if you remember. Super arrogant about it. No, he's, he was right. arrogant about it the whole time. Right. So Stern came on, and I don't know if it was booked ahead of time, but I think Stern may have reached out because at that point, you know, Dan's doing the number one afternoon show in the country, and Dan's whole point was, hey. And this is what I've always said about a lot of this stuff. I don't, punishment is not consistent. When people are like, oh, I just want the officiating to be consistent. I want this to be consistent. It's like, well, then you're hoping for something that's never going to happen because there's nothing in life with punishment and what happens to people. Hey, it happened to this guy, but yeah, but this guy. And he's like, yeah, okay, welcome, welcome to this game that we all sign up for. So when it comes to punishment and like, okay, well, it should have been this. And like when Draymond Green chimes in, it's like, well, hey, dude, you, you think there might be a little bit of a difference based on your back? back yeah. <laughs> You know, um, your background and, and everything else, your track record is really what I should have been looking for there. But I, I remember Stern coming on because Dan Patrick was just like, hey, this is one of those things in the gray area where you shouldn't be this punitive. You should be able to say like, hey, the intent was this, but then it was kind of stopped. And if you're going letter by the law, like this is way too harsh and it could very well decide the outcome of his series here because that Suns team was, everybody loved it. We didn't want to see it go down that way. and. Stern came on and was like, you're wrong, <laughs> you're wrong. And he's right. like, you are an opinion maker, you shape opinion. And Dan Patrick must have said Mr. Commissioner 50 times in the back and forth. He's like, yes, but Mr. Commissioner. But yes, Stern but, but was Mr. scary Mr. when he got like that. I've, I've faced the wrath a couple of times. It, you're on your heels. This, he becomes like a prosecutor and you're on trial. And yeah. he's just going at you. And he, Dan was you, just, I, I can't Dan. describe how scary it is. It was scary listening to it because yeah. it was just awesome audio and Patrick was just really like good with the way he did it because he was still like he wasn't really backing down, but Stern was just going to steamroll him. The reason I even bring up any of that stuff, though, I don't think Silver goes that way. I think Silver is somebody that his his approach to this, if Murray, for the most part, has been a really good guy, is I don't want Benefit to take the a doubt. player. Right. I don't want to take a player out of this spot because that might have been the series. And I know some people could have a huge problem. I'd rather have played out the way that it did. But I would have rather had the same thing happen in 07 with the Suns that I rather would have had Draymond play. I, I just, not gonna, like I remember Parrish when he beat the shit out of Lambeer in game five, 1987, one of the greatest moments of my life. And then just stayed in the game. Even Behind though, Zoe, I, think, I had a Ben. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhere in there. It's I'd, I'd group it with, with having uh, two kids. Um, and they won the game and they went up 3-2 and then the league suspended Parrish for game six. It was the fucking best. <laughs> Even after he had just basically committed assault on Lambert in game five, they just left him in, let him play the rest of the game. So they've been all over the map with this stuff, but for the most part, they've always defaulted to the rules of the rules. And, you know, I thought what Murray did, I that's about as an easy of a one-game suspension. And I'm a, I'm a Jokic fan. I wanted the series to keep going. I didn't want him to get suspended. I just assumed he was going to get suspended. So, uh, predictions going forward? I mean, the series is now impossible to predict, but Denver is going to try to do something that would put them in a pretty special category to come back from 0-2 down, losing the first two at home. Only five teams have done it. They had that on the broadcast at the yeah. end of it tonight. I, for me to say, hey, I still like Minnesota because I picked them. I mean, who's going to sit here today after those two games? Like, it would make sense. Hey, young team, little too soon, feeling themselves after the game two success. Denver figured them out. You know, when this game is 10 points down the stretch, you're like, Denver's not going to get bad looks here. Is Minnesota going to get good looks? Like, is it going to have to be Ant the entire time? Um, I'm not ready to just write off Minnesota, despite what we've just seen through the first four games. Maybe this is Minnesota... You know, do they figure it out this year? Do they figure out, you know, do they figure out between games four and five or do they figure it out this summer? <laughs> right. That's it's one of those. Like. And we've seen this a lot of times in NBA history where just an awesome seven game series. They give them everyone's hugging afterwards. Like, wow, you really brought the best out of us. Might be their destiny, but I still like the way I like the way they played defensively today. I don't know if Denver can do that again. I have no idea what's going to happen the rest of the way. 
Like to me, here's, this here's, is now an official. I'm not betting on this series anymore. No, it feels it just feels seven, and it feels yeah. like it's going to come down to something. It's there and somewhere. at this at this point, you know, if you said, "Hey, I just trust I trust Jokic to get two of these down the stretch more than anybody else out there," as much as we all love Ant, you're right. Here's something I thought was really important though, because if you looked at the regular season to the playoff numbers of the on off with Jokic thing. And we know over the course of the regular season, it becomes this absurd number. And part of it is Denver's bench isn't all that great, but it's like those first few minutes of the second quarter. It's those first few minutes when he comes in, depending on the regular season, the game, the matchup comes in nine, eight minutes left in the game. If they're way ahead, it's, it's later, but those numbers like shape this thing with Jokic, but then Jokic plays more minutes in the playoffs and the bench thing wasn't getting destroyed against LA as much. But tonight I was looking for it. Jokic sits after the first quarter and Denver goes up nine points with him sitting at the beginning of the second. That doesn't happen. Okay, that doesn't happen. And then Jokic picks up the fourth foul in the third quarter. They they sit him with six minutes to go. So that's not even close to his normal rotation. He'll play the full third and then sit in the beginning of the fourth. Depending on how the game is going, he's not afraid to put him back in earlier. So you're thinking, wait, we're going to get six minutes without Jokic out there? And then Denver doesn't miss a shot. Now, granted, they lost four points in those six minutes, you know, up, I think it was either 13 to nine or 15 to 11. That's a huge win to only lose four points when Jokic isn't playing for six minutes, but then you're also going to get him fresh at the start of the fourth as opposed to having to wait for him for a little while. And he has 16 in the fourth. This, that was, look, there's a million things you can point to say, hey, the game was this, the game was that game. When I saw those numbers, I went, that's that's incredible. Well, that, that the, entire time. The, there's one other number along what you just said. Edwards had to play 45 because they couldn't take him out of the game. Like he couldn't come out today. That was it. Like it, and he was not just playing offense, but he was playing like real defense on the other side too. And I, I think Minnesota has to figure out how either Towns or Nas Reed can carry them for four minutes a half because probably not sustainable. Well, not um, hitting shots again too. And, you know, Conley's going to have some moments here or there. The Cat 1 for 10 start was brutal. Rudy's not providing anything offensively until the very end. And you hit on it, but we we spent more time on the Cat stuff. Hey, when Game 2 happened, I brought it up as kind of a joke of like, hey, this is how good they looked without Rudy. Like, huh? And I'm like, hey, look, even me with my Rudy position, that's completely unfair to Rudy Gobert that there's this one game they were this dominant defensively and didn't happen. But now... You know, he didn't have a great game three. He's always going to have some moments defensively that are incredible. He had a closeout contest on Murray where he stayed in front of him late when it was still a huge possession. And you're like, man, look at him working his ass off, staying in front of him. Then he came out at like 333. And I was like, oh my God, are they going to do it? Are they going to do it to just try to get more offense on the floor? And then they brought him back in the game. It's just something, let me put it this way. I'm monitoring that situation. Me as well. I don't know who's going to win, and I'm not making a prediction. I really thought Minnesota was going to sweep them. I thought Murray was hurt, and I thought that was it for Denver. And it was, you know, they won last year, and shit happens. Now I don't know what to think.